As a listener of Conversations on Dance, we know you love the art form. But if you were an audience member, have you ever wondered what it would be like to try a ballet class? We know that stepping into the studio as a ballet enthusiast can be very daunting, but fortunately, Art Emotion has created a safe space for all dancers, from pre-professional through to adults. Art Emotion was founded in 2015 by former Ballet West dancers, Allison DeBona and Rex Tilton. Art Emotion's popular adult summer intensive program returns this May 27th through June 1st. This program includes advanced, intermediate, advanced, intermediate, and beginner classes with no prior dance experience needed for the beginner level. Let Art Emotion be the bridge between the audience and the studio. Come dance this summer. For more information, visit artemotionballetschool.com or click the link in the description of this episode. Are you a passionate choreographer looking to push the boundaries of your creativity? Ballet Collective is now accepting applications for its 2025 Commission for Developing Choreographers. Ballet Collective, the acclaimed company led by artistic director Troy Schumacher, fosters a dynamic environment where artists bring forth fresh ideas, challenges, and innovative expressions. An expert panel, including yours truly, will help select the recipient of the commission, whose work will premiere in New York City in 2025. The choreographer will receive a competitive commission fee, along with dancers, a commission score, studio space, travel, and housing during creative residencies. The final deadline on March 18th is approaching fast. Don't miss the chance to be a part of this transformative experience. Visit BalletCollective.com for more details and start your journey. I'm Rebecca King-Ferraro. And I'm Michael Sean Breeden, and you're listening to Conversations on Dance. On today's episode of Conversations on Dance, we are joined by Jake Roxander, rising star at American Ballet Theater. Jake tells us about the intensity of his training growing up in a family of ballet dancers, why it's important for dancers to keep an open mind about the companies and goals they set their sights on, and how he's handled the challenges of a year marked by numerous major principal role debuts. You can catch Jake in ABT's upcoming New York City Met spring season, June 18th through July 20th. Good morning, Jake. Thank you so much for joining us today. We've been wanting to have you on, on since we spoke about your performances last year that I got to see and was so impressed by. And now we get to hear your story, the story behind all this talent. Um, so we it's, it's the first time we've had you on, obviously, and we always like to start at the beginning um, with how you first became involved in dance. And we have a feeling your story is pretty interesting on that point. <laughs> um. Yeah. Uh, well, first off, thank you for having me. I, I appreciate it very much. Um, and thank you so much for your kind words and uh, your previous podcast. I, I thought that was really, really sweet what you guys said about me and uh, just very humbling. Hmm. Um, ah, my story. Uh, well, I'm, I originally I was born in California and my parents had a school in California called Dance Theater 7. Uh, and after a few years, they they kind of shut that down, and we moved to um, Medford, Oregon, Southern Oregon. And after kind of a, about a three year kind of hiatus, where my parents were essentially retired and could just focus on uh, me and my brother, our schooling, our other activities, taekwondo, swimming, gymnastics, they uh, started oh up gosh. Studio Roxander. Uh, <laughs> so that's where I I was trained, Studio Roxander, by my parents, and. Uh, the, the studio was um, kind of built in memory of my grandmother, Jody White. Uh, when she passed away, my father essentially um, promised her memory would never fade away. And his way of kind of doing that was the studio. And uh, Studio One, our main studio in that building, is called the Jody White Studio. And uh, so, yeah, their, their memory kind of lives on. But, yeah, me and my brother were both trained there. I... Uh, my first ballet class back in California, I was about two and a half, but really when we started back up again, I was seven years old, um, you know, learning first and second position at the bar and mm -hmm. find it, finding it incredibly boring as, you know, most little boys and little children do at, at first. Um, but me and my bro brother really slowly started to fall in love with the art form and here we are. What are the chances? Wow. <laughs> mm -hmm. I wonder... Um if you kind of were resistant to it at first, I can see being in that situation as a kid, it's something that your parents do. You might want to like rebel and be like, I don't want to do that. Was that ever a thing or did you kind of, 
I, I know you said it was a little boring at first, but I just wonder what that was like. Did you feel like they were? Um, that's a good question. No, I don't think I ever felt uh, particularly rebellious. Yeah. Um, but I did. I, I think me and my brother were the same in the fact that we did find it uh, boring at the beginning and not we didn't really, I don't think, understand fully yet, like how incredible ballet can be and how ballet is such a unique art form in the sense that it it's it's so many things kind of just all poured into a smelting pot you know and mixed Mm -hmm. together it's theatrical it's artistic it's um athletic it's it's so many things um uh so i think you know as time progressed and you know you you start to get maybe a little better at your craft and through practice and countless hours you start to kind of realize like this is actually (laughs) quite fun i'm really enjoying this and Mm. uh you know, I, I saw I saw a quote yesterday that says, um, if you really want to know who you are, you have to get close to what you love and who you are is revealed to you through that. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's just exactly the way me and my brother and my my family have kind of been like uh, with our relationship in ballet. And um, mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. it it just really, really grew on me. And completely took off where when I was about 11 or 12 years old, I was absolutely positive what I wanted to do. And uh, I knew exactly what my dream was. Yeah. Yeah. I love that quote. It kind of, it's similar or it feels like it's in the same vein as the Suzanne Farrell quote that I love, which is, she just says, how you dance is who you are. But I think it makes sense. Like we're so, right. that that's our passion. That's our love. So that's how you reveal yourself is through your own dancing, through your own art form. Right. What you love to do. Right. Right. Yeah. I'm curious. We haven't had that many people on the show. I think a few people here and there who are in dance families or parents that had professional careers. But so often it's just like, oh, we just, you know, we're lucky. Like, you know, my parents didn't know a darn thing. And, (laughs) you know, we happen to have this teacher that knew what they were doing and, you know, or just dumb luck kind of. So what's that? What is the situation like when you have parents that do really have a good grasp on what they're doing? And um, do you feel like there was any pressure on their end or like how did they kind of navigate giving you space as kids to do what you want to do, but then also they know how to, how to make you turn you into professionals. So they, they have to kind of navigate that too. Right. What was that like for them? Do you think? Oh, I don't, you know, that's, that's a good question. I don't, I don't want to speak too much on their behalf, but I, I, um, I do kind of get this question a lot where it's like, what was that like, you know, having parents that were dancers and that trained you and, um, it it completely varies person to person. Some people it kind of uh, creates tension and distance, mm-hmm. and um, thankfully, fortunately, I, I've always felt that it brought our family closer. And mm-hmm. the fact that I, my my um, average schedule when I was uh, really a teenager, uh, because I was homeschooled uh, from six, sixth grade on, was essentially I'd wake up do my homework, uh, with, with maybe, or without my mom, my dad would take me to the gym. We do a workout. We go straight to the studio. I take class probably with my father, a private or a big class. Um, then I had to go back to school, work with my mother or whatever in our office, um, with my family, with my brother, then go into another class that was probably my mother's or my father's or, and then move on to the next class that was my mother or my father, wow. maybe another teacher, but it really was, I mean, uh, uh from the car rides to and to the studio and the car rides back from the studio and dinner, we were always together and I couldn't really tell you why, but it, it, it just, it worked. And there was never a serious amount of um, tension or resentment or anything like that. Of course, there were some long car rides home, you know, where, you know we had some serious <laughs> talks about work ethic and, you know, mm-hmm. focus and, you know, uh, all of that. But um, I, I've always felt that it really brought us closer. And as far as for them, I, I don't, I don't know, but I think, I think they would agree in the sense that it, it was just really, it was a beautiful thing that we could bond so much and spend so much time together. Cause I know so many families don't have that advantage, that kind of gift that you know, the, 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 the father, the mother's got to go to work from nine to five and they can't spend time mm-hmm. with their children. And, or maybe the, 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 the kid is, uh, 
more interested in, in schooling and going to college, so they want to go to a public school. And uh, mm -hmm. so that's just a lot of hours being separate. And I always felt just very fortunate to have that. So I think um, it was mutual that we all felt uh, that it brought us closer. And I was always really that's happy right. about that. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's such a great schedule. I mean, you were already, they were already preparing you for what <laughs> professional life would feel like. I mean, it's really right. hard for kids that age to kind of like get that schedule and even be dancing during the day, during the normal school year. So how do you feel that that kind of eased your transition as you went on to your professional life? Um, uh, it was, I mean, it was very helpful just in the sense of, uh, my training mostly, uh, just, it was really just training day in and day out. And I think whatever, uh, craft you kind of, uh, hone your skills on, it's, it's the amount of hours you put in will, will make you better. Mm -hmm. And really, yes, it is about the way you work. That is extremely important, but also the work itself, just spending those hours is, is massive. Um, and I think especially with a career uh, as short as this one, that's that's mm -hmm. one of the things that's also unique about ballet is that this career is so, so short. I mean, you're lucky and you, you know, you're probably going to retire around, uh, you know, 37 would be a, a quite a long career. I think that's when my dad retired at 37. And that's a quite a full career, especially for a male dancer. Um, uh, people go people go longer. I mean, even in our, our own company, American Ballet Theater, Armand is in his 40s and he's still doing these principal roles and doing them outstandingly well. So it's it's incredible but um no um anyway it's uh i think it was a huge it was a huge help that's why i got into homeschooling actually that was one of the biggest mm -hmm. reasons was just that i we couldn't spend enough hours um really honing my craft and and training in the studio if i was going to finish school at around three o'clock yeah. so when is ballet class mm -hmm. going to start you know five right maybe five o'clock to eight o'clock at night, you know, it's till 10 yeah. or that's what the schedule. <laughs> right. is. Yeah. It's so tough. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's tough. And if you just kind of look at it, like, uh, you know, you take two ballet classes a day, every single day, you know, um, in the week besides Sunday, it's, it, if you just look at the hours alone, it's, you're getting so much more time than, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Becky Sue, who's, you know, mm -hmm. doing her, two hour class, you know, once a day, five times a week. So right. you're just, mm -hmm. you're at a huge advantage, number one, but really just yeah, yeah training your body that, yeah, it's gotta be, it's gotta be ready for intense. It's a lot day. of tondus and we yeah. love tondus here <laughs> in this house. Yeah. <laughs> doing them. You know, I, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it just seems like such a perfect setup that you as a kid around 11 can say like, okay, this is what I do. And then you have parents that are just like, okay, this is the best way to do this would be to have you do homeschooling so that we can then arrange your dance training around academia versus the other way around. And yeah, yeah. that they can just so fully guide you through that process mm -hmm. is amazing. The, um, the, the but, pros and cons of it all for sure too. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Having parents that were kind of involved in the dance world and uh, dance professionally and um, all of that, they, they really like, are you, are you sure, you know, with me and my brother, they said, are you sure you want to do this? Cause this is as, as serious as a heart attack. And do you know, serious yeah. as a heart attack, so. what's cool too, is like a lot of people we talk to is like their parents, it, it feels very scary to, uh, not, I don't want to say allow, but to encourage that career path. Cause they don't know if they're good. Like if they're going to make it, you know, but your parents mm -hmm. could be like, yeah, you guys, we can tell that you, if you work hard, you have this potential, you know? So it's like, that's another advantage too, to them. It's, it's really an interesting, different path there. Right. They definitely knew how much it took to get there. And, and I, I think my father and my mother were, they trusted us in the sense that, that we said we really wanted to do this. And they said, okay, but you know, we're not going to let this go to chance. We're not going to take any chances here. You know, we're really going to. Right do do the work we're going to yeah, train right. in the studio and we're going to go to the gym and we're going to do all these things we're going to do everything we possibly can to make sure you really have a happy and full life in the future you know delayed gratification you know do the work now do the things you don't want to do now so that you're happier later and i just kind of thank them every day it seems for you know making me get down in the side splits and all of that <laughs> stuff <laughs> uh, you know so I'm wondering, you have such a clear goal in terms of 
your own technical advancement and the classes you're taking and what you want to look like, the product you want to have. But did you have a clear goal in mind about where that that was going to be? Did you have a company you wanted to dance for or you know, a, a sort of stage career that you envisioned? And how did your parents impact that or influence that particular goal? That's a very good question. Um, I think, uh, of course, being a kid and growing up watching the Royal Ballet and, you know, of course, mostly American Ballet Theater, I, I sometimes have to pinch myself. I'm, I'm, I'm working there day to day. You know, th- those were always big dreams. And um, I think me and my brother had the same kind of uh, plan, so to speak, of, you know, maybe join a, a little bit more of a smaller company, you know, uh, regional or uh, national company um, and kind of grow there and then maybe hop to an even bigger company like uh, ABT or Royal Ballet or, or something, something like that. Um, but, but really it was, it was just, yeah, I mean, the dance world is constantly changing. So I think we knew that growing up that, you know, ABT when I was 11 is, is not the same as ABT now. And, uh, same for the Royal Ballet or, you know, the Philadelphia Ballet when my, my, my brother was getting into the professional world and he joined Boston Ballet. I don't even know if Angel Correa took over the Philadelphia Ballet at that point, but, you know, when he did just as a, for instance, um, the company completely changed, you know, the, Mm -hmm. the repertoire changed, the dancers changed, the kind of choreographers they brought in changed and that, that happens everywhere. So it, it was hard to develop a serious plan as of like, this is my company and that's what, that's where I'm going to go. It was really follow the good repertoire, follow the repertoire you like. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's uh, that, that was always our biggest thing. Mm-hmm. Um, that's always what my brother and I uh, wanted was really to dance the ballets we wanted to dance. Um, uh, the big classical ballets and such. Um, but yeah, I mean, we just kind of uh, went with the flow and you know, it doesn't, it doesn't always work out. My brother went to Boston for a bit and that didn't really work out. He went there as a trainee and then he went to Philadelphia Ballet and Angel saw him and Angel, uh, you know, grabbed him up and he, he kind of flew through the ranks there and uh, he's a principal there now. Um, and he's just been doing extremely well. I joined, uh, uh, the Philadelphia Ballet was, uh, Pennsylvania Ballet at the time, Pennsylvania Ballet 2, their second company. And, it was an incredible experience for me. I learned so much. It was my first time away from home, but it, you know, it wasn't right here and there. And, you know, my timing was not the same timing as my brother's and uh, Stuco kind of fell into my lap. I thought I would improve in Stuco very much just because of their schedule alone. Like we were talking about just the hours alone, the repertoire alone. Um, I thought I'd really improve there. And even if I didn't make it into the company, that would be worth it to improve as a dancer and an artist. And then somehow it, I, you know, I, I joined the company and, um, uh, you know, th- things have not gone the way I, I kind of thought they would. I, I, I never thought I would be an EBT, especially at my age now, um, mm-hmm. especially being a shorter dancer and all of that. Uh, I didn't know if that was really their MO and, um, but yeah, with our new director, Susan, then, um, it's, it's just, you go with the flow. <laughs> So sorry, I didn't draw out that answer, no. but um, really, we we really just went with the flow, followed the repertoire, and followed the just the talent, you know, the 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 directors we really liked, and um, yeah, it's just it, I don't know. I it think just, that's that's mm-hmm. great yeah. advice for young dancers listening because who are you know thinking about companies because it can be so easy to fixate on one in particular, and it can be easy to fixate on one of the big ones, you know, in particular. And I like that you were open to anything and having that realistic, you know, thought process of things are changing constantly. And right now it really feels like a lot of things are changing. There's a lot of um, leadership turnovers. So yeah, following the repertoire is just such wonderful advice, I think. Yeah. Right. And if if you if you really love dance and you want to dance, you you can you can really do that anywhere. And if that's mm. just, I, I think it's just important to focus on that. You know, focus on how do I grow as a dancer and an artist, and you know, where do I go to to really best do that? It's not about you know the 
the the, the title of the big companies or um, nice. prestige or or whatever you're mm-hmm. kind of searching. Or at least that's what I would hope. There are people out there that are more after that, and I feel bad for those people because that's 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 a much harder thing to chase. Right, and it's less of a kind of spiritual path where you can find yourself ultimately. Yeah, uh, and I think too, kind of like. Like not saying like, oh, the first company I get in has to be my company forever. Oh, mm-hmm. rarely know, too. <laughs> so rarely yeah. happens. And and so yeah, I'll, in thinking, oh, I'm gonna get good, you know, um, experience here. Looking that it can at, build my resume. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm wondering at what point prior to these initial op- uh, employment opportunities, did you start to kind of um, branch out from? life in Oregon, like you, you had your head down, you were working so hard hours and hours a week. Um, when did you and your parents kind of decide, okay, this is the year that you should go to a summer program, or this is when you should start being at competitions to be seen. How did you kind of make that transition from kind of strict work in the studio to now it's time to go out into the world a little bit? Right. This is a, yeah, that's an extremely important and and hard, uh, decision for make for for parents and teachers and the students themselves uh for for me i think my my parents really have this mentality for all of their students um and i think it's a very good one that it, before you kind of leave home so to speak and you go to even a suburb program five weeks uh, six weeks um mm-hmm. or if you join a trainee program or uh, you know a, maybe you're lucky enough to join straight into a second company it's 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 a it's a risk and i think the mentality was always like you want to have your, your feet on the ground you want to have a solid foundation that you know when you get in the studio with somebody that tells you to do something that you know <laughs> maybe isn't right or uh, maybe you disagree with you you have the ability to nod your head say sir yes sir or yes ma'am <laughs> and turn around and say i'm not gonna do that thing in the next class and but and and be able to kind of help help yourself through through your your journey uh i'm, I'm over complicating this but it's uh if you if you have your, your your training wheels off and you're and you have a good base your technique is solid i think it's it's a safe thing to venture out but if you're still in a place of i'm kind of finding the technique I, i'm still really in this training part of my journey and you mm-hmm. leave your 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 home or your your school that that has really helped you i think it can get very risky very fast even five weeks or six yeah. weeks that's that seems like a very short amount of time but to a young dancer that is huge so if you're really not ready for that it can be detrimental to your technique or you can get injured or so for me uh when i left home for really the first time for uh, an avt summer um program i was 17 i think it was 2019 um and i i was quite older but also i think we knew what we had and i was lucky that i had my parents and my school that provided a lot you know it provided it provided me the good classes and it provided me the even the the gym training you know my dad was kind of my gym uh uh partner at slash <laughs> it provided everything I needed. And I think they just didn't want to send me away so soon that, you know, Mm -hmm. there could be damage done essentially. Um, if that, if that makes sense, that was kind of their mentality. And when I went to ABT summer program, I felt very ready for that challenge. Um, and then it kind of grew from there and then I joined PP2 and, uh, but we, we didn't, we didn't, uh, rush things to, to go out. Uh, definitely didn't, didn't rush. You just really want to make sure you're, in a solid place as a dancer before you're thrown out there because the professional world, it can be extremely chaotic. It's not nearly as, as safe and um, comfortable and uh, <laughs> kind of like linear growth uh, as, as your, your school, your home. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I hope that answered yeah. your question. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it was a good answer. And I think that that's such an important point. You know, I guess you really only need to be seen by prospective companies in that last hour you know it's better mm-hmm. much better to stay in a place that's nurturing you and giving you the training that you want that's the most important thing because exactly like you said you don't want to go early and then um you don't know how things could pan out you could losing a year if you're 15 or something and you you end up going to your dream school too early and then um it can 
be yeah kind of chaotic or bad you know yeah so it sounds like you did you definitely did the right yeah you definitely did the right thing but i how did you feel since it, it is a little bit later to get be going out into the world so to speak like how did you um feel adjusting to that like how was your first summer program experience was it was it overwhelming or you're just like you know what i'm so solid and confident in my technique and the place i'm at as a dancer this is okay of course there were things that were stressful and um things I got nervous about each day, you know, oh, I have a partnering class coming up. I don't know who I'm going to be with and all of that, which mm. is completely natural, but it was, it was a great experience. And uh, leaving home too was kind of scary for that long. Uh, five weeks to me felt like forever. Yeah. Um, but I, I was lucky enough. There was two dancers in the company, um, Tom and Leanne, uh, and they, they kind of took me in cause we knew them through, uh, uh, parents, her, Leanne's parents lived in Oregon and um, mm -hmm. they knew my family. And uh, it, it, it literally was like fate that brought me to ABT. Mm -hmm. It was like, couldn't happen again in a million years, but um, they took me in. So I stayed with them and uh, it, it was a huge adjustment, but um, it was, it was a lot of fun and I made great friends and just even hanging out with so many, so many male dancers just in the dressing room and day to day mm -hmm. with really really nice for me and refreshing because uh, obviously I, I was kind of the only boy for many years in um, mm -hmm. my in my school at Studio Roxander um, just just naturally it's a smaller school it's not in a big city um, mm -hmm. so so that was something that was really nice for me um, I'm still in contact and uh, very close friends with a lot of those those boys I met in 2019 um, so it was a great experience and it was just a lot of fun and it set up my journey into studio company. Uh, Sasha Radetsky mm -hmm. met me there and um, I, I really enjoyed uh, his classes and his kind of just, just way of um, teaching and all of that. So it, it was, uh, yeah, it, 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 it was a, it was a really good experience. It, of course, things are a little overwhelming, but like I said, I think I had some, my head was screwed on straight essentially, you know, as my father would say, my head was screwed on straight. So I, I knew it was going on and I could take the good and discard the bad and add what uniquely was my own to, to my dancing and all of that. But it was good fun. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Michael here. I wanted to tell our listeners in the D.C. and New York City area about an incredible production making its way to their neck of the woods. The White Feather, a Persian ballet tale, is currently on its Dance for Freedom tour, with stops in D.C. at the Kennedy Center on March 26th and the Gerald Lynch Theater in New York City on March 29th and 30th, with special guest artists Brooklyn Mack and Maki Onuki in D.C. and ABT principals Devin Tusher and Corey Stearns in New York City. Artistic director Tara Gasamia appeared on the podcast in episode 346, where she talked in depth about The White Feather and how her own Persian background and identity shaped the production. It's received raves in numerous publications, so you don't want to miss this groundbreaking emotional production. Get your tickets at intuitvartship.org or follow at Persian Swan on Instagram for updates and ticketing information. How did the opportunity at um, Pennsylvania Ballet come about? Um, really, it, it was through my brother because my brother joins in uh, PB2 and then... Uh, kind of went through the ranks and he had a great relationship with on hell. And, um, I did a couple company experience weeks there, which was, if I can remember correctly, I think a five day program. Um, and it was uh, kind of like, uh, it, it was really a company experience. You, you learned to ballet extremely quickly. You performed it on Friday. You know, you started learning on Monday um, that's so cool. It was, and that's it was for students. Yeah. How does that work? Do you audition to get into it? Yeah, I think I think uh, you, you do audition, and uh, Angela had kind of seen me, and uh, a lot of the kids from the school there were a part of that um, program. So I did that twice. My parents were there. You know, we stayed in my brother's apartment. Um, mm -hmm. So it was very. It, it was nice. You know, it was still familiar to me. You know, I wasn't far away from home, and uh, or or yeah. my family at least. Mm -hmm. um, but kind of through those, I think Angel had seen me. And then by the time I was 17, after doing my ABT summer program, uh, he said, you know, come in and take company class and we can talk. And yeah, he, he offered me a contract and uh, uh, me and a, another girl from uh, our studio. Uh, and 
uh, that that's kind of how it came to be, but really mutually through my brother. Um, mm-hmm. that's how that, that started. I, I, there's not, there, there's very, very many things I can thank my brother for. And that's <laughs> that one of them. He really helped me kind of put my foot in the door and uh, it was a good connection. Yeah. Right. I mean, that must've been so comforting to have this first big step out of the nest with your brother and with another dancer from your studio, Completely. Um, a, a, a really good way to become acclimated to the professional world. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was very, it was very com- comforting. We, we lived together. Uh, we had an apartment that was uh, walking distance from the studios and it, it was a, it was a good time. And oh. I, I mean, I learned so much. It wasn't just my first professional experience. It was my first time living away from home, uh, you know, to have a home away from my, my, my home in Oregon. Um, mm-hmm. So th- yeah, there, it was a huge learning curve. Um, you know, you, you, you look back at those, those moments and sometimes you cringe at things that you did and mm-hmm. you know, or, of course, you know, it's oh, that only gets worse. Back. Wait till you're in your thirties. <laughs> oh, yeah. You're going to hate everything you did. <laughs> you have all your twenties to cringe at. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. I, I mean, yeah. But it, it was, no, it, it just... was yeah very helpful to have him there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So then what so, made you feel like you wanted to go to um, ABT Studio Company then? Really, I mean, uh, it was such a, a turn of events that even I'm like, what, what happened first? And <laughs> But I think I think mm-hmm. Sasha, Sasha kind of reached out because he knew uh, me from summer. Mm. I, think, I think he had a position open for a boy. I think they'd lost the boy. And it just, it, it kind of came to be, but really ultimately... And completely, to be honest with you, I was, I went to studio company because I knew in my heart I would improve there as a dancer and an artist more. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, there was other, there was other things. There was contracts, you know, question marks, you know, Mm -hmm. I don't know if Philly was sure they could provide me uh, or or could provide their, their dancers, the, uh, an apprentice contract and they Mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was very up in the air. Um, which isn't anybody's fault. I don't blame them for that. I think, you know, it's like a lot of ballet companies, they were struggling with money and all of that. Um, uh, but, but ultimately I, I had spent a whole week in New York with studio company and I quite literally sat in the front of the room and um, watched their whole schedule. I took class with them. And then after class, I would just watch them rehearse and, so I, I really, really knew exactly what I was getting in for. Um, and I, I just knew in my heart that I was really going to improve there. Uh, I was, I was going to improve on my, in my weakest areas and even my strongest areas would improve. Um, and, and like I said, I mean, just the hours alone, uh, working from yeah. nine to four yeah. every day with like, uh, you know, a 30 minute lunch break. It was, it was hard, but very good work. It was a mm-hmm. really good experience. Um, mm-hmm. so that, that was kind of, that, that was my deciding factor. It was not about ABT, um, the, that title or anything like that. Um, right. it, it was truly just, I just knew in my gut that I, I, I had to go and, and take that leap of faith. Cause that was another thing. I, I, I try my best not to make decisions out of fear mm-hmm. and I felt it, it maybe to stay in, in Philadelphia, which, which might feel safer, you know, out of fear of going someplace new. Um, I felt that that was not a, a good decision, you know, mm-hmm. that you should not make right. decisions out of fear. Um, right. So, so that was really why. When you first got the job offer in Philly, had you considered trying to find something else or were you just like, this is what's presented me? you know, what's been presented to me as an opportunity and I should just take it because it's there and this is fate or whatever. Or did, were you thinking like, oh, what about the Royal? What about ABT? Is this the right? Or, other you know, what was your thought thought process? Yeah. Um, I think we did. We did expand our search. You know, we, we wanted to not uh, uh, be too, too focused on like, like we were talking about before, one company that we ignore all other possibility. Something right. like ABT or Royal, you know, felt, I think, very big to, to my family and I, and, you know, we, we didn't want to, you know, jump into a pond, maybe that big, mm-hmm. um, quite yet, but 
really, I, I think we knew on how, uh, we knew on how the way he ran his company, uh, quite well. And, um, I mean, in, in my opinion, uh, the Philadelphia Valley is some of the best rep in the country. Um, so that was huge. Um, and I, I, I think when they offered that, uh, Pennsylvania Valley two contract, it was, it was really, it was exactly what I, I wanted. I mean, it was, I, I, I loved the company and I, I thought it would be really amazing to dance with my brother, but I, I really did love just the company and mm -hmm. the repertoire. And I thought, and, and the city, you know, uh, Philly's a great city. Um, so yes, we did, we did keep our options open. I kept my options open, but it, it was really, yeah. it was a good opportunity that what I kind of right. wanted to jump on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so then you're in studio company, you're, you're making this progress, you're working these hours. Um, you know, it's not unfamiliar to you <laughs> hours and hours of training and work and rep. Um, but then once you're in the main company, the opportunities start to kind of just cascade, you know, you're like <laughs> Mercutio and peasant and etudes and puck and, you know, boom, 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 very quickly. What were some of your initial reactions to this and how were you keeping yourself together as it is sort of like a barrage of opportunity? It's a wonderful thing, but is it, was it overwhelming or, um, you know, how did you handle each of these really big, big moments? It's a good question. Um, it's, it, it, it's an embarrassment of riches for me. I'm just so humble, you know, each day, uh, it's not at all kind of what I expected. Like I said, when I joined studio company, I, I was, I was prepared not to join the main company, you know, and uh, uh, kind of jump over to another company um, with that Stuco uh, on my, on my uh, resume, but it, 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 it happened, it happened quick, but there, there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of kind of, it's just really in life. There's always those moments where you're at a crossroads and you go right or left. And I, I, I just kind of tried to stay true to that, you know, decision that put me in Stuco in the first place, which was, you know, how am I going to improve as a dancer and as an artist and, and just try to, to, to stay true to that. And I think that that served me well. Um, Neapolitan was kind of thrown in my lap as one of the first bigger roles, but something like Mercutio, uh, which I had the honor just to learn, mm -hmm. I was learning at the time. And then of course, what happens a lot of the time is, you know, uh, the first cast Mercutio got injured. And luckily at that point, I had rehearsed myself so much at home over the Christmas mm -hmm. break <laughs> and I'd gone uh -huh. over the solos. And I mean, I, I, I have it on my Instagram. There's a video of me in, in the studio, like doing the solo terribly, just trying to figure mm -hmm. out how to get through the steps and the meticulous choreography that, that um, when this boy was injured and they said, you know, uh, it was on the schedule, Roxander variations, you know, with Carlos Lopez, mm -hmm. I was thrown in and I was learning the sword fight, but I, I had so much of it ready and I was so kind of ready to go that uh, they allowed me that opportunity to get a show. And I think from there, it's kind of grown. But um, yeah, I don't want to get too wordy, which I already am. <laughs> That's what this podcast <laughs> is for. It's chatting <laughs> and going deep in the stories. No, we love it. <laughs> it's, it it's, been, it's, been really, it's been really incredible. And I think what my brother had in Philadelphia, where he had his kind of timing was, was really just right, I think I kind of have found here. Um, or at least, at least I, you know, I, I hope, you know, um, <laughs> but it's just, it's been an incredible experience and, and yes, it, it can be a little overwhelming, but there have been a few moments where, uh, in something like etudes, which I have video of my father doing with the national ballet of Canada, this was one of his favorite parts. Mm. Um, I, I know that music, like the back of my hand, um, mm. uh, there was there was moments where I just I, I just felt so at home and so much like I, I've been waiting my whole life to do this. So the excitement almost um, was more than the nerves. And I think uh, I, I just felt very much at home. Of course, of course, you're nervous, but something like Puck as well. I mean, if there's one image of my father as a dancer that stands out in my brain, it's it's him as Puck. You know, I have him. On, on my wall uh 
as Puck in the same costume that I wore um, on the National Ballet of Canada magazine. And to do that part was really, it was in his exact costume, almost felt like this just kind of spiritual, religious experience in a way. Um, but, but there was definitely moments like that where I just felt like I've just been waiting my whole life to do this. And I, I couldn't be more happy to be here and more honored to be here and just more thankful that ABT gave me that opportunity and threw me that bone. Um, so yes, it's, it's nerve wracking and it's a little overwhelming and you get a little shaky at times, but mostly I'm just grateful. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's such a nice way of thinking of it. Like, well, A, it's lovely to know that you have nerves. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I think that's much. what you were trying to find out. <laughs> just, you get nerves. Very much so. <laughs> well, no. Yeah. But then it's just like nothing you do in the performance would ever belie any nerves. And I think that that's also a good lesson to younger listeners or people that are still dancing now. It's like clear that you you have those, but the way it sounds like the way you combat that is by centering yourself through gratitude. Like if you focus on that, then it kind of takes away from the other scarier side of things. Right. Yeah. Right. And preparation, it seems like to me too, that you really are diving deep. And what else are we doing? Are we calling, are you calling your dad and you're like at the end of a rehearsal day, this in puck, like, I mean, I would totally do that. Totally. <laughs> Pick his brain. Totally. Um, no, it's, I mean, it's incredible. I mean, talk about an advantage with a part like that. I mean, he has mm -hmm. stories about Sir Frederick Ashton being at the front of the room and being a, uh, yes, rookie, smoking his cigarette. <laughs> that, that was some um, good. Keep that. And uh, yeah, so it, it was quite funny. I remember one rehearsal of Puck, they told me to do this and this and this. And I said, okay, I, I don't, I don't mean to be disrespectful at all. I will do whatever you tell me to do. But my dad like told me the story about Sir Fred and he, he liked this version. Like, would you guys be okay if I did this version? <laughs> you know, just like turn my head away and then, then look instead of look first. And they let me do it. And, but it, I mean, it, it, <laughs> It was so fun. I remember being in those rehearsals and having uh, our ballet masters like uh, speak to us and me and my other cast of Puck and um, talk to us about things and just having a huge grin on my face. I remember uh, Carlos Lopez like looked at me at one point and said, what? What are you laughing about? And I was just like, I am just happy to be here right now. This <laughs> is just so fun. Like I, mm -hmm. there, there, there were certain things, you know, etudes and puck, just seeing my dad do those things where I'm just like, oh, I'm born to do this. This is just fun. I mean, I'm in no way saying I, I do it perfectly or, you know, anything like that, but just to be out there and just to experience that, it's just like, oh, it's just a blast. Mm -hmm. Do you Great identify time. as a bunhead? <laughs> At time, yeah, probably, probably at times. I just love it. You just love ballet so much. It's like so I, infectious. I, I love it. <laughs> I do. I, I love so many things. I mean, I grew up with comics and, uh, you know, cinema and so many things, but, and, and they, they all bleed into my dancing very much, but yeah, mm. uh, ballet has its moments for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, something that I really enjoyed your performances in the fall season at ABT as of course you have such a strong virtuoso technique the pirouettes and the elevation and everything is just there but I feel like you never do it at the expense of other things it's never it's always musical it's um never greedy um I guess I want you I want to know like what what influences that how do you find that balance between doing something that is very impressive you know we get to see the eight pirouettes but how are you doing that in a way that's still artistically compelling or has integrity oh well i mean first off thank you very much that's very sweet of you to say <laughs> um but uh i don't know i can't take credit for a lot of those things um i think a role like puck for instance um or, or even Mercutio, I'm working so closely with uh, our, our kind of ballet master in the company, um, our ballet repertoire. I, I, I'm not exactly sure what his title is at this specific moment, but mm -hmm. uh, working with Carlos Lopez, he, he's just so, he's just such an incredible coach. And he did the part so much himself that mm -hmm. there's been plenty of times where not just with Carlos, with Clinton Luckett and um, John Gardner and his wife, Amanda, and our, our, our staff where there's moments where they say, you know, 
yeah, like turn turn fast there, but make sure you do that run and that slide on the seven of the third eight. And like, you know, don't get greedy here because you have this moment here. And th- there's been so much help. And I'm so grateful for that. You know, of course, I, you know, you try to do the work on your own and on your Christmas break, you rehearse and whatever. But um, I just had so much help, especially in, in that particular um, area that you've mentioned where you're saying, how do you, how do you do that without being kind of greedy or taking away from the character or the the ballet or the musicality of it all? I mean, so much of that came just from other people and just rehearsal and um, being really clear about the, the version, you know, and um, also letting me have fun in, in certain areas, just really kind of making it my own and, um, yeah, but I really, I've just, I've had, I've had a lot of help in those moments, which has um, been been great. Good coaches are so important. Very Helps much to pass it down, you know. Uh, yeah, all these people that you mentioned, like they're all such a part of the ABT legacy, you know, that they're connected to the repertoire and the um, ABT experience through many decades past. So that's kind of a beautiful Completely. thing to have. Um, Completely, that yeah. Connection. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm wondering what is next in the casting pipeline for you? What can we look forward to seeing you in in 2024? Oh, gosh. Um, I don't know what I can say. I'm like, yeah, or what you could say right. what you're working on. <laughs> yeah, maybe say like, what you're you know, rehearsing, maybe. I, think, I, yeah. I feel like a Marvel actor. I'm like, I can't. Can I say casting? <laughs> I, I don't want to spoil anything. <laughs> um. We're, we're working on a lot. We're working on uh, Wolfworks, um, Wayne McGregor's ballet that was at uh, Royal Ballet. Um, I think I have uh, some 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 great dancing in that. Um, uh, we're working on on Yegan, uh, I uh, which has been um, incredible cool. and and uh, in a way just chaotic. It's been it, we've been kind of setting it very quickly and uh, but it's just been great fun. It's another great ballet at night. I really have my fingers crossed um, for 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 a great role in that. I really hope I get a show in that. Um, Who's staging that, or who are you working with for your on again? Jane Bourne. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. Uh, sh- she's been in there, and she's been setting everything. She's been setting Lenski and Onyegin and Olga, and uh, the Potter does also all the core. She's really been at the helm, um, and it's been yeah, it's been a very uh, kind of funny and uh, interesting experience, but. But uh, fun. I'm, I'm really. Uh, I got my fingers crossed. I got my fingers crossed for for uh, a show because it's 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 a great ballet. It's great music. Um, it seems like another role that I, I feel uh, is could be suited to me. Well, I feel like it's it's a role I could have. I could have fun with. Yeah. I'm just not sure I'm allowed to say. That's so. okay. That's yeah. okay. We'll be watching past. <laughs> That's good to we'll know. Watch. It's good to know what you're working on. Yeah. yeah. I, and I guess just to round things out here, you know, I, you're so humble and it seems like, you know, you're you're very quick to say like, I think it's right for me, for my type or, you know, and I guess <laughs> you, you do, you do take like a, a duck to water in these parts that are these like maybe traditionally shorter or more virtu- virtuoso male dancers, like kind of the Herman Cornejo pipeline of rep. Mm-hmm. Um, but are there ways that you, goals you have in the future, things you think like 10 years from now, I hope I could expand my rep to include this and this. Like, what do you think um, when you when you look back at your career, you would you would like to have in your rep that maybe wouldn't immediately come to mind? Completely. Yeah. I, I mean, that's definitely, I don't want to say it's a worry, but it's, it's a, it's a real thing to be a kind of quote unquote typecast as a, you know, a little bit of a shorter dancer that, you know, you're always the soulless part. You're always kind of the guy where it's like, get out there and jump and turn. And, um, which is, which is great. I mean, there's incredible parts in that, uh, you know, Puck and Mercutio and there's so many kind of, um, principal parts but but um i don't know how to put that it's it, it's that are that are great fun there's there's a lot of great parts mm-hmm. out there that are kind of like that that are um generally shorter type but mm-hmm. i it has always been my dream to do a part that maybe is not completely 
suited for me, you know, off the top of someone's head, like Siegfried or Albrecht or, you know, I would, I would love to do uh, Basilio, which, you know, might be a little bit more up my alley than a princely role. Cause I think there's a very realistic stigma where if you're not tall and you don't really have the nice feet and legs and, and whatever, that you can't be a prince and you can't lead a ballet and you can't partner the ballerina and uh, such and such. And I, I think there's always exceptions. Uh, you know, I, I, I find very often that some of my favorite dancers in, in those parts are a little shorter, you know, Nureyev, Barishnikov, um, even, even Armand is um, a shorter dancer. And yeah, so, so, so I, I really, really aspire to do, to do roles like that one day. And I, I really hope I get the opportunity because I know if I, you know, down the road, you know, keep working on my technique and my uh, partnering and my artistry and all of that, I, 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 I would, I would um, love to do those roles and I think I could do them, do them well. So that's a, that's a dream of mine. I definitely don't want to be <laughs> like put in a box, mm -hmm. um, but I also don't necessarily feel that a ABT has done that or anything like that. So I don't, I don't want to, Right. Send out that yeah. that wrong message. I think they've given me a lot of opportunities, and I'm like, wow, I'm so so glad they're putting me in a part like this. You know, they're they're putting me in a, a, a heavy partnering part or 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 whatever. Um, so that's so we'll realistic. See. That happens to all dancers, I think. Like everybody, like because it can sometimes feel like they're but being put in a box just because of what they dance and they always aspire to go, you know, expand beyond that and push beyond that. So I think that's absolutely realistic to say. Yeah. For, right. I think for anyone with like, with major talent, like there's like, mm -hmm. there's always that turning point, you know, like who we talked to, what was it Sarah Marines? I think that was saying like, you know, she felt like she had a, a box oh, yeah. at some point and it was mm -hmm. like, I mean, she was, like my box was amazing. It was just like the best balancing roles ever. Mm -hmm. And, um, but then, you know, you do want to start exploring, um, finding other sides of who you are, other facets of your. Oh, artistry. Megan so, Fairchild was yeah. saying that too. It was I Megan. Remember. It was Megan. Megan. Okay. Yeah. 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 Cause very similar, like virtuoso, you know, and she wanted to kind of push out and expand and, and she did. And right. so you will too. <laughs> I hope so. I hope you're yeah. right. Uh, yeah. yeah it's, it's a dream. I mean, to be, to, to lead a ballet, like, like, like that would be just just absolutely incredible i can't even imagine you know being a, a sick breed or something like that but It'll happen. we'll see we'll right watching. now it's just it's it's left foot right foot left foot right foot just <laughs> forward that's that's the philosophy so very good time will mm -hmm. tell. well we are going to be here every step of this left foot right foot journey <laughs> <laughs> so Thank, Thank you, you so much for joining us today, Jake, and anyone in the New York area or in one of the cities that ABT tours to. You guys tour so often. Um, of course, we hope all of our listeners there will come check you out in performance live because it is quite the experience. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, Jake. You're too sweet. Thank you very much for having me. It's been fun. Thank you. Conversations on Dance is part of the ACAST Creator Network. For more information, visit conversationsondancepodpod.com.